Welcome to worship this morning at Bethel on a gorgeous, sunny, warm, breezy Sunday morning. Um, we're, we're glad that the sun is out and the rain is gone for now. Um, quite wild weather this weekend, but beautiful morning this morning. And because of that, gathering on the green will actually be on the green on the yard behind the church here on the north side under the trees. So there'll be breeze, there'll be shade. Uh, so after church, please head out back for a time of fellowship. Um, uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, please remember Pastor Dave and Jody as they travel back from Kent's wedding this past weekend. Uh, they'll be arriving back in Sheldon sometime this week. And also story time and day camp will be starting this week as well. Um, so please keep that in your prayers. Um, there's a little announcement in the connection that Sue is still in need of some items. So if you're able to help provide those for her, please do so. Oh, okay, she's good for supplies. So just pray for day camp and, and story time. Um, everything is ready to go. We welcome uh, Pastor Roger Voskill to our pulpit this morning. Uh, he's retired pastor living in Sioux Center. So thank you for being here this morning and welcome. Um, happy Father's Day to those of you that are fathers out in the congregation. Um, it's a time to either remember our fathers or, or thank them for uh, what they provide for our families each and every day. And with that, we're gonna have a short video um, on Father's Day, and after that, please feel free to greet each other. Three. Three? Yeah. That is a good number. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Um, let's just concentrate on this one for now. <laughs> hey, what's it like being a dad? Hashtag gag me. Ugh. <laughs> Mr. Clams has been sleeping for two days, Daddy. Goodbye, Mr. Clams. No. All right, just slow down a little Dad, bit. Stop yelling at me. I don't think that's. <gasps> oh, okay, okay. All right, and that is why we always wear our seatbelt. And that's the birds and the bees. So proud of you, son. Run. Huh? Run, it's gonna blow! No. Have I told you lately? I know, Dad. You love me. You tell me all the time. Actually, I was going to tell you I think you're beautiful inside and out. Whatever. You are disgusting. Yeah, Dad, you are disgusting.
This right here goes to your future, this right here goes to you, and this right here goes to God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How much does God get? What's wrong, beautiful? Trevor broke up with me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> He's such a jerk. I, he broke up with me on a text message. He just replied. Dad, I can't believe you. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. He didn't deserve you. <laughs> he didn't deserve you. One, two. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good to us. God has the coolest job, getting to make clouds all day. Yeah, he does. But I think one of his very best jobs is when he made you. Daddy. Hey, what's it like being a dad? How much time you got? And please remain standing as we begin to worship our God, who is the only one worthy of our praise.
Let's enter into a time of prayer together. Father God, on this Father's Day, we recognize you as our one true Father, the giver and sustainer of life, the one who leads, who guides, who directs. Lord God, we thank you for being our Father. We thank you for the heavenly fathers which you've given us 
who have those same characteristics as you, uh, who can lead, can guide, can direct, provide strength when strength is needed. Thank you, God, for, for all that you do, for the rain and the sun, and all that you provide. Father, this morning we um, come before you with some needs we want to lift up to you, uh, Pastor Dave and Jody and Ross, as they have celebrated this weekend uh, a wedding and adding a new daughter into the family. Uh, but we pray for safe travel as they return home now from Tennessee, that um, you are with them each mile uh, and bring them back safely to Sheldon. We also want to remember Gail Rolfe says she has an upcoming surgery. Uh, we pray for peace within her uh, and we pray for the, the doctors and the nurses that will care for her during that time. We also continue to lift up to you Andrea and Brad um, as they continue their cancer journeys. Lord, we're, we're thankful that Brad's surgery uh, went well and that he is recovering. Uh, we continue to lift him up as he recovers, and we pray for those doctors and nurses that, that are caring for him, uh, that he may soon be able to uh, come home from the hospital and continue on with this journey. And we, we lift up Andrea and Rick and Jessica and Austin as, as they walk through uh, Andrea's cancer journey as well. Um, just enfold them in your arms and give them each and every day what they need. Father, we also pray for those who are grieving loss today. We continue to remember the Den Hartog family. Uh, Father, that you wrap your arms around them as well. Give them peace and comfort as, as they deal with loss and grief at this time. We also lift up to you those in our congregation who cannot regularly join us and, and worship. We think of those that are in Fieldcrest um, and Sanford Senior Care and other senior cares as well that, that as they continue on in their, the end years of their life, Father, that you, they feel your presence with them and they feel our prayers and, and our visits as well. Lord God, as we are about to take up our morning offering, you know the needs of this congregation. But Father, we ask a blessing on this offering that it not just be for our use, but for the use of the church in this community and the use of the church in this country and in the world. That you take what we have, what you have given us, and what we have to offer back to you in return and bless it. Bless it mightily for your work. And God, as we close this time in prayer, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite the deacons to come forward to collect this morning's offering.
invite you this morning uh, to turn for our scripture to John chapter 21. And uh, if you have Bibles or want to use the Pew Bibles, you may find it handy to kind of keep the scripture open instead of reading the entire passage we're going to look at. I'm going to kind of refer back and forth to it and work our way through that section of scripture. As you're turning to that, just let me say it's uh, good to be with you. Uh, my wife, Kathy, is here along... Uh, with me this morning, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, I am retired in Sioux Center, at least I think I'm retired. Um, it's been unbelievable the phone calls the last few months for preaching um, in area churches. Uh, two weeks ago I was in Primgar, last week I was in Rock Rapids, this week I'm here, next week I'm in Sioux Center, and I have one Sunday the entire summer that I'm not preaching in some place and I have turned down multitude opportunities. So um, good to be with you. I mentioned uh, I am kind of retired. I go out preaching. I also work for Memorial Funeral Home in Sioux Center. And then the other thing that occupies us is we have 10 grandchildren. And uh, uh, we have four grandchildren living in Hall. Uh, our son-in-law, married to our daughter Renee, is the principal at Boyden Hall High School. So few of you may have had contacts that way. And our other two daughters, uh, Dana and Lori, uh, live in uh, Orange City, and they are MLC. So, for example, uh, this past week, I think I made 15 or 16 softball or baseball games. So the whole summer, our week is just kind of uh, filled. We have as many, sometimes as four to five ball games, either afternoon or night. But uh, we're thankful that we can enjoy that, and it's a wonderful privilege and opportunity. So, I want to share with you this morning, um, don't expect anybody to remember, uh, it was a year ago, August, I was here with you, and I shared a message with you at that time that was entitled, What a Fish Story. And I almost titled the message this morning, Another Fish Story, because that's exactly what we want to look at. A year ago when I was with you, we looked at Luke chapter 5, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, where the disciples go out to fish and they catch nothing. And then Jesus tells them to throw the nets on the other side of the boat. And miraculously, there are fish all over the place. And they fill the boats with fish. And the disciples were absolutely amazed. And then it is that Jesus turned to them and he said, Come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, push the fast forward button, and we're going to speed ahead about three years later in Jesus' ministry. During that three years, these same disciples have followed Jesus around. They have seen him do some astounding and amazing miracles. They've listened to his amazing teachings. But then it all ended. Because all so quickly, he was arrested. He was falsely accused. He was mocked. And he was nailed to a cross. And he died. And they put him in a tomb. And these disciples who had such high hopes and who had grown to love their master, were devastated. And then there were reports about an empty tomb. And they could hardly believe it, and they didn't know what to make of it. And then they saw him, and he was alive, and he was living. That sets the stage now for we, what we want to look at this morning. John chapter 21 begins this way. Afterward, now remember, this is after his ministry, after his crucifixion, after his resurrection. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, 
Nathanael from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. That night they caught nothing. I'm not a great fisherman. I've had a few opportunities to go out fishing. In fact, I've had some wonderful opportunities to fish up in Alaska because we have a friend living up there. And in those times, I've, I've appreciated, but, but I'm not a big fisherman, but those who are fishermen here this morning, when you go out and you catch nothing, you have a lot of time to do what? Think. To think. Because when the fish aren't biting, and I had that experience as well. One time I paid good money for a charter on Lake Michigan out of Sheboygan. And we went out six hours, perfect day, perfect weather, perfect lake. And got one fish. And so you sit there. And as you sit there and nothing happens, you have a lot of time to think. So I imagine this night... The disciples had a lot of time to think. Remember again what I said. It's after Jesus' ministry. It's after his crucifixion. It's after his resurrection. But ever since his resurrection, things have changed. You know, before they followed Jesus around and they watched him and they listened to him. But now it's different because after the resurrection, Jesus would suddenly appear and be in a room when the door was locked. And then he'd be gone. And they didn't know where he was. And then all of a sudden, there he would be again. And then he would be gone. And so I imagine that these disciples that night in the boat, catching no fish, and they're thinking. Can you imagine with me? What thoughts are going through their mind? Maybe an imaginary conversation went something like this. So what are you going to do? I don't know. For three years, they've followed the master around. They've, they've given up their livelihood. But, but what now? And so maybe they were kind of bouncing it back and forth. And maybe one of them said, well, I, I guess I could go back to fishing. And I imagine that maybe one of the disciples in the boat that night said, what about you, Peter? Peter, Peter, what, what, what? I said, what about you? Oh, uh, um, I don't know. I, I wasn't thinking about fishing. I was thinking about what I did. Three times. Three times I told the master I didn't even know him. Three times I said I didn't even know who Jesus was. How could I do that? How could I fail him so miserably? I was so sure of myself. I was so confident. I, I would never do that. Three times. I said I never knew him. And maybe one of the other disciples said, Oh, come on, Peter, don't be so hard on yourself. You know, we weren't much better. We all took off and ran. We were scared. And maybe Peter came back and said, yeah, but you didn't deny him like I did. Three times I said I never knew him. And maybe as they're pondering all of this and there's no fish that night and the morning light is breaking and there's somebody on the seashore and they, they probably don't even notice it. And if you have your Bibles open, you look at verse 4, it says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. So keep in mind, you and I are tipped off. We know who it is. They don't have a clue who it is on the shore. And this voice, this person on the shore, calls out and says, Haven't you any fish? He picks up. Probably, probably somebody just wondering if it's worth going out fishing and 
Well, it's obviously not. You've been out there all night. You've caught nothing. And so you call back, no, forget it, not tonight. And they don't know who it is, okay? And the voice, the person on the shore says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find them. What? Are you kidding me? We have been out here all night. We don't have a single fish in our net. And now somebody on the shore, you don't know who it is, remember that, says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And you're thinking, yeah, right. But if you're a fisherman, have you ever had this experience where maybe you've been fishing for a long time, maybe a couple of hours, and it's been nothing, skunk. And you figure, might as well go home. But then you think to yourself, one more. You ever do that? One more cast. Because maybe, maybe you'll get a bite. And so maybe those disciples in the boat thought, it's not going to hurt, is it? So they drag the heavy nets in from the left side of the boat, and they throw them over to the other side of the boat. And all of a sudden, they're splashing all over the place in the water, and the net is getting heavy, and you're trying to tug it. And you suddenly realize, you've got fish. Fish all over the place. They're filling the net. And these are fishermen by trade. So you imagine how excited a fisherman is when he ties into one or his net is full of fish. And as they're trying to tug that net in full of fish, all of a sudden they hear a splash, and it's not the fish. It's Peter. Peter jumps over the edge of the boat in the water. A fisherman forgetting about fish. Is that possible? Peter forgot all about the fish. He jumps into the water. He scrambles to the shoreline. And you know why? Because when the net started to fill with fish, it is believed it was John, the beloved disciple, who said and suddenly realized this just doesn't happen. He said, it is the Lord. And when Peter heard, it is the Lord, he didn't care about fish. He didn't care about any of that. He had to be with the Lord. And he jumps overboard and he scrambles to the shore. And he gets to the shore. And there's Peter. And there's a fire prepared. And Jesus already has some fish on the fire. And as the other ones drag the heavy net full of fish to the shoreline, they get into the shoreline and Jesus says, bring some of your fish. And what does Peter do? Peter is in the boat in no time, gathers up some of the fish, brings them to Jesus, and they must have put those on the fire as well. And they gather around the fire with Jesus. And then it tells us that Jesus served them bread and fish for breakfast. Now, as Jesus serves them, what has to be going through their mind? It wasn't that long ago. They had gathered in an upper room, and Jesus had taken bread, and he had broken the bread, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And I'm sure all of those memories have to come flooding back as they're now sitting on a seashore. They've just witnessed a tremendous miracle of fish. And as Jesus serves the bread, they have to be thinking that. And what about Peter? Peter remembers because it was that night that Jesus had said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, oh no, some of these other ones may fall away and all of that, but you don't have to worry about me, Lord. And then the first one came and said, weren't you one of his? Never heard of him. And three times. And so all of these memories have to be flooding through their mind. And they get done eating. And then Jesus addresses Peter. And he says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Wow. What a question. After all 
that Peter has been through and perhaps all that has been going through the mind of Peter. And Jesus says, Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these? And some commentators suggest that maybe when Jesus asked the question, he kind of took his hand and, and he kind of motioned to the boats and the, the net full of fish, which was the livelihood of many of those disciples. And, and maybe Jesus said, Simon, do you, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than fish? Do you love me more than a livelihood? Do you love me more than all that stuff that has consumed your life? love me more than your your work, your occupation, the things that consume your life? Do do you love me more than all that stuff? Not that it's bad stuff, not at all. Do you love me? And Peter responds and he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, feed my At a time when Peter was perhaps thinking he would be reprimanded by the master. There's not a reprimand at all. The master simply asked him. He said, Simon, do you love me more than all this stuff? And he says, feed my lambs. I've got work for you to do. And then Jesus does it again. And he says a second time, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. I know it doesn't look like it. I know I've messed up. I know I've failed. Lord, you know that I really love you. And Jesus comes back a third time. And he says, Simon, do you really love me? And the scripture tells us that this time Peter was hurt. Because this was the third time Jesus asked the question, how many times did Peter deny him? Three times. And all the memories have to be flooding back, and and Peter has to be processing all that and, and wondering, Lord, why do you have to ask me three times? I've told you twice over. Lord, you know that I love you. And each time when Peter responds, Jesus said, feed my lambs. The second time, he said, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said, feed my sheep. In other words, the master is saying to Peter, I haven't given up on you, Pete. No way. And you say you love me? It's not just about words. It's not just about songs you sing. It's about what you do. It's about how you live for me. And Peter, I am calling you to live for me by doing the works that I've called you to do. And a few verses later, in the same John chapter 21, I think it's verse 19, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, follow me. That was the very call three years ago when the Master said, follow me. And I believe that had to be like music to Peter's ears. To know that Jesus still trusted him. To know that Jesus wasn't dwelling on the denials. He was dwelling on his love for Jesus. And he had work for Peter to do. And don't we all need to hear that often in our lives? I want to share a story with you. I I didn't have a Father's Day message for you. If you would bring the, the map up on the screen. But I want to share a story about my father. And maybe it's appropriate on this day. I've got a pointer here. This is just a little sketch of the home place that I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up right near Lake Michigan. My dad had a dairy farm. And so we had a large barn and a silo and a shed here where we put the tractors. And We had a cattle yard. And then this was what I called our, our door yard. You see these little markings? That was our baseball field. The whole neighborhood would gather there and we'd play baseball every night of the week. And then down here, this was lawn. For sake of story, just keep in mind, these are wired clotheslines attached to poles and attached to our garage, our house, and our lawn. And back here, you can hardly read it, it says utility pole. I just want you to get a picture. 
this is my home place on my dairy farm. Now, my dad didn't have a farm like you guys have today. My dad just had a dairy farm. We had about 30 cows. Our corn planter was two rolls. I know, that's an antique. But that's all my dad had was a two-row corn planter. And we just had older tractors, nothing like you've got today. So I remember, I think I was about 10 or 11 years old, and I took lunch out to the field. Remember those days when, when mom would pack a lunch and you'd take it out? And I loved those days because mom would pack a sandwich and all these goodies, and you'd take it out, and you'd sit down with dad in the field under a shade tree. By the way, in Wisconsin, we didn't cut trees down. We used them for shade. I know here you think you got to have all the land, get rid of the trees. My dad would leave big trees in the middle of the tr field, not kidding, because he said, it's a good place to have lunch. And it was. And so I brought lunch out to my dad, and he had just finished planting that particular field. And it was quite a ways back on our, on our, our property. I mean, we're, we're talking hundreds of yards away from home. And when he'd go out there with the two-row planter, he'd always take the old 1950 Chevy Blue pickup, and he'd load the bags of seed corn on the back of the pickup and fill the planter every time it needed to be filled. Well, when I came out there for lunch and we got done eating lunch, my dad had a problem. How do you drive a pickup back home and a tractor and planter? Now, in those days, when we had the cattle, we would run them down a lane way back because we would pasture them out in the pasture. So we had barbed wire fences in these narrow lanes. I knew there was no way Dad would drive that planter for me. So I said, hey, Dad, I'll take the pickup. Now, I'm about 10 or 11. I had driven the pickup a couple of times with my dad present in the pickup. This would be my first time alone. And amazingly, my dad said, Okay, be careful. So I climbed in that 1950 Chevy Blue pickup, and I headed for home, and, and I came down all the way from way up here, and I came down this lane, through the fences, through our cow yard. This gate was open, and I came this way, and all this open space was ahead of me. And I thought, no more fences. Let's see what this Chevy can do. Now, it didn't do much. It was a 50 Chevy, let me believe you. But I hit that foot speed, and that old Chevy started to pick up speed. And I was in there, boy, 11, 10, 11 years old, and I come flying across here, and I got about halfway across our ball field, and I pushed the brake, and it went all the way to the floorboard. Nothing happened. I kid you not. I pushed so hard, I almost pushed my foot through the floorboard. Nothing happened. So I'm sailing along pretty good right here. Good idea to go to the house? Nope. Garage? Nope. Half tree? Nope. Right here. Got the most space right here. So I did. I came flying across here. The old Chevy pickup had a little lip where the hood came over the windshield. Caught every one of those heavy wire clotheslines ripped those hooks out of the garage like it didn't even exist, yanked the wooden poles right out of the ground, helped to slow up the pickup a little bit. I came flying across here. Front bumper hits the utility pole where all the electrical wires to the farm are hanging. It stayed standing. And I stopped. And I went, I opened my door to the pickup, and there's clotheslines and poles hanging all over the place. But I stopped, and I started to get out of that pickup, and I heard the tractor. It was my dad. And I shook my head, and I said, oh, my goodness. My dad came home with that tractor walked over, kind of looked at the clotheslines and poles hanging from the pickup and up against tight to the utility pole. His first words were, are you okay? Yeah, 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 kind, kind of, I think. So I'm not sure I will be okay. I am right now. <laughs> and the next thing I remember, my dad 
is undangling all the wire clotheslines from that pickup and the poles, and he's getting them all clear, and he got in, and he backed the pickup up, and, and I said, I hit the brakes, I hit, the, oh, I didn't tell him I hit the foot piece first, I said, I hit the brakes, I hit the brakes, he said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, this old baby, once in a while, you got to pump them two or three times to get them to grab, now you tell me. Three days later, dad is going out to plant another field of corn got the pickup loaded with seed corn. He's got the tractor hooked up to the planter. How's he going to get both out there? I said to my dad, foolishly, I said, I'll take the pickup. You know what my dad said? Okay. Those, that was the magic word for me. Okay. It meant my dad trusted me again. I had failed. But my dad trusted me again. You think I was careful this time going out to that field? You better believe it. And he let me drive that pickup many times after that. But I'll always remember that. He trusted me again. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for Peter. He trusted him. Peter had said, I don't even know who Jesus is. And Peter and, and Jesus says to Peter, I need you to go feed my sheep. I need you to go tend my lamb. And that's what Peter needed to hear, like I needed to hear. And you and I have that kind of a dad. He's a second chance dad, isn't he? He gives us a second chance, even when we mess up. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this story that you've shared with us in your word. And Lord, so often we are, we are just like Peter. We deny you. We fail you. And Father, we are thankful that you don't give up on us. You still love us. And you call us to follow and you give us a job to do. So Father, thank you for your amazing love for us. May we serve you and love you in return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing about the power of Christ's redemptive love.
Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen. Just a reminder, gathering on the green behind the church under the tree. Oh, Lord.